Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern bar cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another glorious episode of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. We have a terrific interview episode this week featuring two awesome people from Charm City Meadworks, a Baltimore-based company that produces the Mid-Atlantic's favorite meads. Yeah, that's right, the stuff that Vikings like to drink. But before we jump into today's episode, I want to alert you to one small change we've made to our podcast page. As the modern bar cart community has grown over the past year or so, we've been starting to get requests from folks who really want to contribute to our discussions about spirits, cocktails, and home bartending. People who have stories of their own to tell and want us to help them reach a wider audience. We think this is just fantastic. So what we did is we added a link on our podcast homepage over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast, and you can click on this link to visit our brand new submissions guidelines page. This short and informative webpage has all the details on how to pitch us your podcast ideas, as well as some important terms of use that come along with putting audio content out into the podcast sphere. The direct URL for that page is modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast dash submissions. So if you've been getting the itch to write something, record something, or otherwise influence the type of content on our podcast, please head on over there to learn how. That said, I think it's time for you to make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is called the Mead Fashioned. And if you think this is just a meaty spin on the old fashioned, well, you'd be correct. Mead is an alcoholic beverage made by fermenting honey. And so it makes sense that you might wanna pair it with spirits where honey could be one of the tasting notes, bourbon being one noteworthy example. To make a mead fashioned, you'll need very simply two ounces of bourbon, three quarters of an ounce of off dry, semi-sweet or sweet mead, and several dashes of aromatic bitters. We always like to use our embitterment aromatic bitters. Combine all these ingredients in a mixing glass with ice, stir until well chilled, strain into a rocks glass over a nice big ice cube, and then garnish as you do with an old fashioned with a lovely orange twist. The mead fashioned is a perfect example of using one of the qualities of mead, in this case, sweetness, to sub in for that same quality in a classic cocktail. In this drink, the mead is replacing the sugar cube or the simple syrup, and depending on the sweetness of the mead you're using, as well as your own personal preferences, you might decide to nudge that three quarters of an ounce of mead either up or down to fit your palate. The cool thing though, is that along with that requisite sweetness, right, along with checking the box in the cocktail recipe, you're also getting the other flavors that come with the mead, which is gonna yield an old fashioned riff that is completely distinct from anything else out there. Cocktails are pretty cool, right? We also have on the show notes page, a really lovely bonus cocktail handcrafted for us by Hillary Harris, whom we'll speak with later in this episode. This cocktail is an elderberry mead blackcurrant cosmopolitan, which is a mead-driven take on that cocktail that dominated the 90s. To make one, you'll need one and a half ounces of vodka, a half ounce of triple sec, half ounce of elderberry mead, two ounces of blackcurrant juice, and one quarter ounce lime juice. And to make this drink, you'll combine all these ingredients in a shaker with ice, shake it like a Polaroid picture, and then garnish with your favorite citrus twist. This is a balanced, fruity cocktail where the complexity of the mead and the blackcurrant juice plays a really pleasant counterpoint to the citrus and the triple sec. The only problem I could see is getting your hands on some blackcurrant juice, but if you hit up Hillary on Twitter, at Charm City Hills, spelled like it sounds, then I'm sure she can share her secrets. 
please also head on over to the show notes page to check out this recipe alongside the gorgeous pictures of this cocktail, courtesy of Hillary's extremely talented partner, photographer, Marco Gonzalez. Now that you've got your drink in hand, let's turn our attention back to the lovely bee's nectar that is made all the more lovely by the people who turn it into mead. Now, I caught James, Hillary, and the rest of the Charm City Mead Works team on a normal workday in the middle of the sweltering summer. So in this interview, we get straight to business. Or, as beekeepers and mead makers like to say, buzzness. But before we start, I do want to throw out a quick little overview of their product lines and general availability so that you can get your hands on their products if you're fascinated by this episode. Charm City Mead Works produces both still and draft or carbonated meads. The still varieties come in 16.9 ounce or 500 ml glass bottles, and the draft varieties come in your standard 12 ounce cans. The still mead flavors, which are about 12% alcohol by volume, include original dry, sweet blossom, strawberry ginger, and apple cinnamon, in addition to their small batch and seasonal releases, and the draft flavors weighing it at about 6.9% ABV get a bit more exotic. Wildflower, basil lemongrass, elderberry, mango campagno, pumpkin, and raspberry coconut, just to name a few. James and the team inform me that anybody who lives outside the Mid-Atlantic and wants to get their hands on some Charm City Meadworks products can head over to Vino Shipper and have them delivered right to your doorstep. We've got a link to Charm City's Vino Shipper page right in the show notes, so head on over there if you'd like to support them by placing an order. In this interview with James Boycourt and Hillary Harris, some of the topics we discuss include the most common varieties of mead you'll come across, from the Renaissance Fair to your local supermarket, how Charm City Mead Works grew from a kitchen countertop operation to one of America's biggest and fastest growing mead producers, a few ways you might begin incorporating mead into your home bartending pursuits, tips and resources for home mead making and beekeeping, a few notes on how we can help preserve our struggling pollinators, and much, much more. We're super stoked for all the cool flavors and the tremendous growth that Charm City Meadworks is experiencing, and as James mentions later in this episode, it's all because of their kick-ass team. So without further ado, let's get buzzed with James and Hillary from Charm City Meadworks. James, thanks for being on the podcast. Absolutely, glad to be here. So can you just quickly introduce yourself to our listeners and tell everybody what you do? I am uh, James Boycourt, co-founder of Charm City Mead Works, and I am the mead guy to pretty much everybody I know. <laughs> this business here started on my kitchen counter. We make a kind of a newer, more updated type of mead. I find it's a little bit more like a good introduction for people a little bit more of an everyday beverage than mead has been in the past mm-hmm. yeah it kind of uh it looks just the way you brand it is more functional than some of the some of the old timey looking stuff that that was around at least before yeah we really wanted our branding to convey basically what we were putting in the in the package and for that to be something that was more up-to-date and a little bit more approachable. Uh, We needed to have the packaging kind of shake people out of the preconceived notions of what mead was in the past. Mm -hmm. Hence uh, why we do 12-ounce cans and little, uh, you know, 16.9-ounce bottles. Right, right. And definitely a a much more geometric kind of thing, which works because of the, you know, the honeycomb and the the hexagon there. But it's, uh, you know, all the colors are beautiful. So I first encountered your product just because it was incredibly beautiful on the shelf at so many of these retailers that I was visiting in D.C. So how did you take it from your kitchen countertop to a kind of essentially a, a manufacturing facility that we're sitting in today? It's been a lot of really long hours, a lot of sweat equity. This was something that both... My business partner, who's now uh, left the company, and I uh, came from an engineering background. And process is something that we were really interested in. So I've also done a lot of things hands-on in in my life. So every time that we started looking at how to do something more efficiently or build something new out, 
it's just another project to uh, dig into and, and manage. The From the recipe end of things, I got into this a long time ago um, from a sort of a hobby level and started thinking, well, you know, there was a lot of potential for this. I think when I say it started on my kitchen counter, there had been a lot of experimentation going into this because even five or six years ago, there was very little information out there about recipes and that type of thing. And really what we were seeking to do was create a mead that was something that people would want to reach for every day, which is really different than how mead has been treated in the past. So the information for making the product that we wanted to take to market really wasn't there. It's been four years of building everything from a new uh, sewer line for this building. Very hands-on. Mm, yeah, <laughs> um, gotta love it. Straight to figuring out how to package stuff in cans and bottles. And we've, we've done pretty much everything ourselves here. We've got a really great team of people. I'd say if there's anything that somebody is going to take away from our experience, you know, and, and look to do something on their own, uh, whether it's meat or anything in life, you can't do it without a really awesome, versatile crew of people. And uh, that's probably been the, the biggest reason that we've been able to do this. For sure. Yeah, everybody I've met has been super great. And, you know, I think they're, they're, they really walk the walk here, for sure. So... Can we just give a, a basic working definition of mead for people? You know, I, I think people are familiar that it's honey-based, but maybe just place your stuff on a spectrum with the other stuff since obviously sure. you did kind of approach it with a new template. So mead is basically, uh, by definition, it's, it's honey-based. It is the world's oldest fermented alcoholic beverage. So it's been around. A lot of people would think, oh, yeah, you know, the Renaissance Festival or medieval times or yeah but it's really been around since before written history it goes way back and was something uh, universally enjoyed by the mesopotamians the greeks the romans the egyptians it, it basically every culture that was lucky enough to have honey bees had some version of mead it's kind of spread its way around the world it comes in all sorts of different varieties uh, worldwide from everything like what we do that's uh, much more low alcohol and sort of more of a light refreshing drink to stuff that's highly alcoholic in the like 16 18 percent category that would have a you know still be really sweet and would be sort of more of a holiday or right like special occasion kind of beverage so what were the vikings drinking in the viking mead hall so they were drinking a lot of different kinds of mead everything from stuff that was lower abv to stuff that was you know the full heavy octane mm. variety gotcha gotcha so it's it seems like even though your approach is novel it's like just kind of a little section of what mead can be yeah, and I think that we uh, look to do some more sort of limited release, very, you know, special edition things and mm -hmm. the more high alcohol, higher ABV kind of thing. So I think the biggest thing that separates us is we saw a an opportunity to introduce people to a more approachable version of mead. Right. And we've grown to be one of the largest meaderies in the country in a very short period of time mm -hmm. from one that started with almost nothing in terms of equipment and materials. And it's, uh, it's, it's been an interesting road, but I think what that shows is just how much people are really latching onto our product and enjoying it. For sure. So we got we to talk about the bees now. Yep. So who is the keeper of the bees? Where are the bees that make this honey? And how do they, how do they work into this process? So I actually uh, got into uh, this as a master beekeeper. I took a uh, introduction to beekeeping in college. It was a, an elective. I had to do a bio elective and this was the most interesting thing out there. So I figured why not? And like many things in life that you don't realize are going to steer you in a very different direction later on, 
here I am. Got very involved in entomology and beekeeping and was homebrewing at the time. And I still continue to keep bees and occasionally teach classes and that kind of thing. I think at this point we would need, you know, hundreds if not thousands of hives to keep up with what we do. The other thing is that most people don't realize when bees are bringing honey or creating honey, it's it's basically bringing nectar back to the hive from whatever floral source they're, uh, you know, gathering from. And it can be very different uh, from hive to hive, even when they're right next to each other, depending on what they're foraging from. So we go to a wholesaler up in Lancaster that gathers basically from all over the place. And they give us very consistent ingredients so that we can turn out consistent products all the time. Right. We do a little bit with varietal honeys and local stuff, but that tends to be more a limited release. For sure. So this is kind of a timely discussion that we're having because there was uh, some articles that dropped recently about some pesticide regulations that are getting deregulated by the Trump administration. And so can you just make a plug for our pollinators and, and that whole, you know, how to save the bees? Yeah, uh, the biggest thing you can probably do to help save the bees is either take, take on a little bit of beekeeping yourself. If you don't want to handle bees, uh, plant flowers that are friendly to them. A lot of people don't realize just how important wildflowers and letting clover grow is everybody mows their lawn and that tends to wipe out a lot of the the clover i think that contributing to your local beekeeping organizations you know if it's something that you want to support in some way it doesn't take much to um, help get more people involved and more interest out there those are all good things politically i'm uh, almost afraid to open up that can of worms there's certainly some things, uh, some pesticides that are a really big part of farming these days, and it's a it's a really difficult problem for bees and for farmers. Uh, you you got to realize that there's a lot of stakeholders um, right. in anything like that. I'll, something that a lot of people don't realize is a probably even bigger issue is the use of Roundup in no-till farming. Basically, what they do, where I'm from on the eastern shore, is they go and they round up an entire field and then they'll use a seed drill to, you know, basically put all the soybean or corn seeds uh, in the ground. But by roundupping that large an area, you also uh, inadvertently kill all the, like, wild flowering stuff that's out there. And it kind of creates a, a desert for bees, even though the, the space looks really green. And whether it's, you know, pesticides that are kind of affecting bees like these neonicotinoids that are really in the news right now or some other pathogen, like if the bees don't have food or are having trouble foraging, that's something that's going to make their life a whole lot more stressed and make them much more susceptible to everything else. Right, right, right. So it's it's a complex problem because... You know, for instance, no-till farming is a huge deal because it helps eliminate erosion. So if you till everything over, you have a lot of erosion, and moving away from that was a really good thing. It's it's a not something that's an easy answer. Right. It, it sure seems like it. And, it, you know, obviously, because we're pumping so much of this out of a, a largely a monoculture system with the farming, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be really, it would be really hard to shift away from that abruptly. I think people uh, learn, and you'd be surprised uh, how quick things move along if you, if the tide seems to be going in that direction. Farming is getting smarter than it ever has been before. But it, again, it's a, it's a complex problem with a lot of stakeholders involved. I don't think that our current administration's views are probably that of a lot of the farmers out there. I mean, just look at what's what's been going on with these tariffs it, you know it, it's something that requires a really um, all-encompassing analysis and approach to try and solve because if, if it's not holistic you're not going to solve the problem it's you're going to find a solution that probably isn't going to work right for sure well you know in a big kind of sticky problem like that i think the biggest thing that we can say is that 
the bees don't have a voice. So when you can be a voice for the bees, and if, if a good can of mead or bottle of mead is your incentive to, uh, to be that voice, then I think uh, that's a good thing. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. <laughs> so what is what can you share with us about, you know, the future of Charm City? What are there any cool projects that you might be working on or uh, any any, um, you know, beyond expanding territories and, and picking up new accounts? What are you working on? I think we've got some new products. I would like next year to be really a, an even bigger year for us in terms of offering new new things and maybe doing more collaborations. This year, basically the last 18 months have been really focused on building out our new 10,000 square foot space, getting our tap room open and starting to have more events, that kind of thing. And I guess that's another thing is really, you know, now that we have a brick and mortar location for people to come to, it's a lot of fun for us and a lot of fun for everybody else involved to, to have some stuff going on here and get people in the space and every day it becomes a little bit more fun so i think next year we're going to have a lot more events here from a expansion side of things i think we're looking to get into some new territories like new york which would be a really big deal because i have a lot of family up there who's been begging for a long time but you know product development is um something that's probably taken a little bit of a backseat to us having a space where we could really you know, delivered everyone. And now that that's kind of come to a close um, and we've got something here, we want to, you know, want to put ourselves out there a little bit more and get back to creating really awesome products. Yeah. When you take a a project like uh, a new facility, uh, so many things do take the back seat. And so it's kind of like, it's almost like you're trying to eat a pizza from the crust and you're going to kind of try and turn it and work your way in there. And it doesn't matter, doesn't matter what you do. You're there's always a piece of the pie. You're not quite biting off. We always have lots of friends that are getting into the industry, uh, usually on the brewery side of things. And what I always tell them is they're like freaking out about like all the work involved in opening up is like, wait till you try and do something like this with the business actually already up and running. Because it's a tremendous amount of work to, you know, to run the business and building at the same time is, is just constant. It really shows me what you know kind of looking at what other people do the difference between people i'm just like holy mackerel they are an amazing business person to people that i'm like oh well that's really cool let's you know kind of see how it goes right you know it's it's a it's it's a definitely a tricky thing Mm -hmm. yeah no no easy way to do it couple quick lightning round questions. I want to let you get back to it because you have a busy day here. But two of the, of the usual lightning round questions that I think really apply here would be, do you have any advice to somebody who might want to start doing this at home like you did? Any pitfalls to avoid or things to definitely do? I would say there's a lot more information out there. I think one of the best things about the internet these days and what's really out there is that Everybody has access to the same resources. You know, gotme.com, my friend Vicky Rowe uh, runs that, and it's an amazing website and forum for all kinds of recipe and discussion. Don't take anything sort of at, at first pass. Uh, there's, there's lots and lots of information there. So, you know, kind of go after it. Yeah, take, a, you know, take, take a look at that. The, the basics are pretty easy. You don't need a tremendous amount of equipment or other things to sort of set up and try it out. Especially if you've done home brewing, right? Yeah. Well, actually, you know, even if you haven't, really, you could start with sanitizing a jug of water and having a mixing wand in there um, or like a water jug, like a deer park or something. Right. You, you don't need a tremendous amount of stuff. What you do need to do is pay more attention to it while you're working you know there's a lot of very helpful people out there who would be excited to you know see somebody else learning and you know love to give them a little bit of advice sure yeah we get a lot of uh, folks who recommend apprenticeship if you want to you know if you want to go do something at a higher level just offer to go somewhere and be some do, do a little bit of work for free so you can get that knowledge 
I think that apprenticeship and sort of mentoring is something that's just way underappreciated in society right now. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that, you know, for anybody like me who's spent a lot of time trying to learn things myself or to grow, I've been lucky enough to find those people and have those people in my life who are there to show me stuff. I've always found that it's a really enjoyable thing to, you know, to help somebody out. Mm -hmm. And I think most people feel that way. So ask, you know, the sort of silliest thing is to throw down something yourself without talking to anyone. And if it's not that great, you, you know, feel like you failed or it wasn't up to your satisfaction and you kind of go walk away disappointed and don't do it again. The persistence, talk to people, mm -hmm. ask questions, and you will end up with something pretty awesome pretty quickly. Right, yeah, and to put it in perspective for people who might be a little bit more on the introverted side and tend not to want to bother other folks, I this is going to be probably the 61st or 62nd episode of this podcast, and I've talked to some people who I'm surprised agreed to talk to me, but I literally have not gotten a straight-up no from anybody I've asked. So ask and you shall receive. You know, mead making is something that I think there's probably a lot of introverts who started doing this. <laughs> it, it tends to be something I think attractive for a lot of people who are not necessarily bandwagon folks. Um, sure. You know, if if you're if you're interested, go t start asking around. You'll find some help pretty quickly. Yeah. One last thing I did want to ask was if there are any influential books about either bees, beekeeping, or mead that might be something someone can pick up and start chewing on. Well, there's uh, one beekeeping book which is massive, and it's kind of the Bible. People definitely should probably buy it if they're interested in beekeeping. There's all sorts of old editions available on Amazon. Sure. It's The Hive and the Honey Bee by Dayton. And that's a, I don't think that's an, a beginner's guide. You also might consider uh, getting something like a beginner's guide to beekeeping or, you know, there's lots of good beginner books out there. As far as mead makers, the Complete Mead Maker by Ken Schramm is one of the sort of fundamentals that a lot of people get. But then again, I think that you could probably get a good portion of what you really want off gotmead.com. That's just such a great web resource. And Ken's book tends to focus on how to make specific kinds of mead more than you know, a wide variety. Sure, sure. Okay, well, we will definitely link to like all those little resources, be they web resources or print resources, right on our show notes page at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. Just search for this episode and uh, you can also stream the episode right there on your browser from the audio player at the top of the page. So James, I'll, I'll let you get back to work here, but I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to speak with us here today. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for the interest and for coming up. It's always pretty enjoyable to get a chance to share what we do here with everyone else. Yeah, amen. That was Charm City Meadworks co-founder James Boycourt. And to help us out with the cocktail side of things, I also spoke with Hillary Harris. Can you just introduce yourself and tell us what you do here at Charm City? And then we'll jump into some mead questions. Yeah, sure. So my name is Hillary, and I'm the Maryland sales manager for Charm City Mead Works here. I also have a bit of Pennsylvania as my territory as well. Cool. So that means that you're out talking to people about mead and trying to get new accounts, right? Constantly. I am always out on the road, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we have questions here today pertaining specifically to the types of meads that Charm City creates and then also, you know, how those might be used in cocktail setting. Mm -hmm. So can you start by telling us what different styles of meads there are out there in the mead continuum and then explain to us sure. where most of your products fit? There are so many, honestly. I think that the one that people are most familiar with would just be the medieval mead style, you know, the one that you see at Renfest and whatnot. So it tends to be much higher in alcohol, around 19% or so, and also a lot sweeter and more viscous and thick um, than what we do here at Charm City Mead Works. So yeah, the, most of the styles are pretty sweet. Personally, for us, we prefer for ours to be much drier and uh, 
just a lot lighter, so more approachable. Uh, we usually have our ABB around 6.9%, and it tastes flavor-wise more like a cider than it does like your typical mead. Okay, okay. So does that mean that most other meads out there, like you're, you're describing this typical like Renaissance Fair mead, those tend to be sweeter. And usually like in the wine world, when a wine is sweeter, it means there's lower alcohol by volume because less of the sugars have been turned into alcohol. Is that usually the, the line of thought? In some cases, the alcohol percentage is actually higher for those because it's a longer fermentation time. So they have to like keep pitching more sugars and honey into it. For us, we are, is considered young mead, I guess. So we don't age ours for as long as most people do. But there are a lot of styles that are popping up where it's not quite as sweet as your typical Renfest mead is. Like Meridian Hive in Austin, Texas, they do a fantastic mead. Like, And you'll see on their label, they have dry or off dry or sweet or semi-sweet. Like you would okay. classify like a Riesling or another type of wine. Sure. Yeah. I think Riesling is exactly where my head was at with yeah. that. Okay, so most of yours are a drier style, younger style, almost like if we're staying on the wine comparison, like a Beaujolais Nouveau or exactly. a nice, fresh, uh, stainless steel uh, white. So I like that. I, that's that's what I drift toward. And that's actually like, I'm from DC. And obviously, that was one of the markets mm-hmm. that you were in pretty early on. And so I've, I've really enjoyed your products because I do tend to prefer the drier stuff. But that does potentially present a problem with cocktails in that cocktails really do often operate on uh, the component of adding a sweetener to something that's a little bit more spiritous. So the fact that you have something that's a little bit drier and then way lower ABV than a spirit might just kind of throw some people for a loop if they were thinking about making cocktails with it. So can you maybe explain some of the flavors that you have of the of the mead and then maybe how those might be entry points into the cocktail world? Yeah, sure. So um, I actually like to introduce people to very simple cocktails that they can do with our mead. So for example, our basil lemongrass, which we brew with Thai basil, is something that's super aromatic. So it works very well in cocktails. And I personally, whenever I'm doing an event or a tasting where I'm telling people how they can incorporate our mead into their drinks or just drinking as you normally would like a cider or a beer from a a can or a glass. It's really good in just a very simple gin and tonic, honestly, or you can incorporate it into a Bloody Mary as well. And it really adds a new flavor profile to the drink. The elderberry is very versatile. It tastes kind of like a rosé and it's light and has that nice tartness to it and also that very nice pinkish hue. You can really put that into so many different cocktails. It's, It's especially good with like an elderflower liqueur. Mm. I really like to put it in Bellinis for brunches. <laughs> and the wildflower is also really good in mimosas because it does have that nice dry, um, slightly earthy champagne flavor to it. And they're very effervescent. So so it seems like it's good for a lot of highball cocktails where there's right. you know something something else in there. And, and the, there's a effervescence to the, the mead, correct? Correct. Got it. Got With it. With the canned mead anyway, our draft mead. Uh, we also have stills, so that would be more like your higher ABV, 12% wine formats. Okay. And I've, so I've seen these on the shelf in various forms. Uh, really enjoy the cans that just come in, you know, your regular six pack. And then are the still meads, those are the ones that come in the little like eight ounce glass bottles or 10 ounce glass bottles? Yeah. So those are our 500 milliliters. Um, they're like the grenade bottles. Yeah. So we have a few different flavors. Original dry, um, which we do also age them in bourbon barrels. So the original dry in particular picks up like this nice oaky sort of quality to it. A little bit of butteriness from the, uh, the bourbon barrels. So I love putting that one in bourbon cocktails because you've already got those flavors with it. Another personal favorite of mine is the rosemary, which will unfortunately be going away soon. Oh, no, that's one of my favorites, too. I love it so much. Yeah, I stocked up. <laughs> nice. Sweet Blossom is another really good one, and that's, uh, that's honestly our um, sweetest variety that we do because we brew that with orange blossom honey. So that's a good one to incorporate into, like, simple syrups or, again, just, like, a standard old-fashioned you can put a little bit of that in it if you prefer for your old-fashioned to be not quite as sweet as just putting like straight up simple syrup into and we also do strawberry ginger right now for the spring and the summertime which is just fantastic Mm. that's a good one to put in sangria honestly yeah yeah or a punch i mean uh, ginger is a really nice spice or an aromatic to add to any of those classical punches throw it in something fruity and you're good (laughs) yeah or like a summer cup right Mm -hmm. which is kind of what we're thinking right now what about this coconut raspberry oh the raspberry coconut yeah um honestly put it in a mai tai and it will make your life (laughs) how did you come up with 
raspberry coconut as a as a mead flavor that you were going <laughs> to develop. I, th- I feel like so people generally know uh, you know mead is a honey based mm-hmm. fermented beverage, but how do you get the flavors of these things into the mead? Then honestly, that was Elliot's brainchild when he first told me raspberry and coconut. And I was like, really? Um, okay. But then I tried it, and it's one of my absolute favorite ones that we do. It just came about by a happy accident, really, as far as I know. We do these things like on our tap room, we do Project X kegs, and that's basically um, our our chance to just experiment with the mead. So we put um, different herbs in it, different types of fruit, and if it works, it works, and if not, then we'll never speak of it ever again. <laughs> mm, right. <laughs> so yeah. I think it started out as a Project X keg, and then um, everybody at the tap room was just raving about how good it was um and then we decided to keep it around yeah flying dog the uh brewery in frederick maryland has a similar story where they do their brew house rarities yeah exactly things, and uh the, that's where their bloodline um their bloodline blood orange ipa i believe yeah. came came from and now that's like more, probably their most popular skew yeah so um our spring seasonal ruby red rose that was actually my project x with uh, grapefruit zest and rosebuds and then it became our spring seasonal <laughs> cool yeah, I really love that. So you do a lot of seasonal stuff, and then most of the stills that you do are kind of like just available generally throughout the year. Yeah, exactly. We have a few that are year-round, and then we do some for like the spring and the summer, and then we do another one for the fall and the winter. Okay, cool. So one thing that you said, or I guess a kind of a group of things that you said, I just want to kind of call out and elaborate on because I think it's a really great piece of advice in the cocktail world mead seems to be in this like weird in between place when it comes to cocktails it's not sweet enough to be a sweetener or the exclusive sweetener it's not boozy enough to be the exclusive source of abv unless you're going for like a massive session cocktail or like potentially a weak punch but it seems like what you're saying is that it's got a it's got a little bit of that stuff so if you want to cut back on some of the other sweetening agents in a cocktail that has a sweetening agent like your classic old-fashioned example Mm -hmm. or if you'd like to add complexity to a cocktail that seems to really accommodate and uh you know just flourish with complexity like a mai tai right then it seems like these are really good opportunities if you you know just take into account that you are going to have to tweak some of the other stuff in there if you want it to come out correct is that generally how you think about it yeah and honestly when i'm making cocktails i'm not really trying to like follow a set recipe i'm just trying to have fun and experiment um one of the one of my favorite going along with what you said cocktails that i made recently was um just a simple margarita with our mango comopeno and it was amazing and i also made just like a very standard simple syrup with honey and with a little bit of jalapeno just to make it a little bit more spicy mm-hmm. and it was fantastic and i love doing stuff like that yeah nice well hillary thank you for giving us these insights into cocktails i was dying to talk to somebody about how to actually start using meat in cocktails because it's something i haven't really done a lot of so anybody who's listening in the dmv area please pick up some Charm City Mead and tag us at Modern Bar Cart on Instagram or Facebook and show us what you've created. Make sure you tag Charm City as well. Yes, please. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start cocktail revolution here and by spreading the word you're helping us fight the good fight you can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear also definitely follow us on instagram and facebook at modern bar cart for cocktail porn recipes and entertaining tips and keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. 
this episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, beekeeping and mead making wisdom by James Boycourt, cocktail kung fu by Hilary Harris, and a little interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2018.